Welcome to Books, Beauty, and Business. Our goal is to inspire, motivate, and encourage others through laughter, accountability, success stories, but most importantly, easy steps for achieving greatness. My name is Tani Bro, and today I'd like to introduce you to Jamie Burkhart. Jamie is a Texas COS grassroots coordinator. If you haven't heard of COS, that is Convention of States. She is tired of big government. She asks us to join the fight to put our runaway federal government back in its box by calling a convention of states. This is something that really crosses all party lines. This is for people that really see that uh, proposed term limits, fiscal restraints, reduce the size and power of the federal government are all good things that need to happen. And convention of states is the solution as big as the problem. So I am very excited to hear what she has to say today. First, a shout out to our sponsor. Thanks to our sponsor, Success Headway Advertising and Digital Marketing. Check out their website, successheadway.com. Okay, let's jump right in. Well, welcome, Jamie. I'm so glad you are here with me today on Books, Beauty, and Business podcast. I'm so excited to share your story, share a little bit more about your organization, just really educate people on what you've been working on and what you're doing. Um, you have a fantastic a fantastic role within the COS. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks, Tony. It's um, a pleasure to be here and looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, first, let's just dig right in. Like, how did you get into, tell us your story a little bit. <laughs> um, sure. So um, I actually, uh, Convention of States Action is an organization I volunteer with. And um, before I um, had even heard of Convention of States. My, my regular job is uh, to uh, be a flight attendant. And I actually found a book on the plane. Um, that book was by Mark Levin called The Liberty Amendments. And uh, it was a hard uh, hardcover book that somebody left and they didn't come back for. And I picked it up. And I thought, oh, that looks interesting. No one came back for the book. So I threw it in my backpack and I carried it around for probably six months. Oh, wow. I finally got around um, to reading it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the author goes through and lays out a lot of the, what what he sees is kind of wrong with our federal government mm -hmm. and, and laid out a solution for how to fix that. And I, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. I thought, oh my gosh, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is how we fix some of the problems that we uh, have in our country. But the thing was, is I'm, I'm just one little person. I didn't really know that much about government. And so I started Googling around and I found that uh, uh, the Convention of States organization had already been put together. There were uh, there was a grassroots movement that had um, a setup in all 50 states already. So I didn't have to invent the wheel, thank goodness, because I wouldn't yep. have been very good at that. I could just sort of jump into a team that had already been put in place and just, you know, add add what I could do to help start educating people about Convention of States and, and get involved in this movement. Because I really, really feel passionately that you know, we're, we're on the wrong track in this country and we're going to need to do some, some, something different in order to, to get our spending down, um, to get our, our federal government, the, the overreach in, in terms of, of spending and in terms of regulations, uh, the, the, the way that, um, our representatives are there for decades on end. You know, these are the things that we really need to address and fix. And Convention of States allows us the opportunity to, to do that in, in a way that's constitutional. Uh -huh. so, awesome. Yeah, so make a long story longer. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> no, I love it. And I feel like there's a there's a huge lack of education for probably a lot of reasons, right? Um, you know, you're not learning this in school. You're not learning about some of this stuff where you think naturally you would you would learn about it. So when you talk to somebody that you feel that is aligned with, hey, these things aren't right, like how do you bring up this topic? Like what's the first thing that you start talking about? Um, you know, that's a that's a great question. And and one of the things I throw out is, you know, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the federal government? You know, how, how's, how's big government working for you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most people are very happy to, to dive right, right in because, you know, everybody's got, you know, a DMV story, right? I mean, we all know that departments that are run by the federal government are, are atrocious. 
uh, and could probably be much better handled by the private sector. Um, one of my favorite things to talk about is uh, our national debt. We all know that it's unsustainable. Uh, this movement got started probably about 10 years ago. And at that time, our national debt was about 15, 16 trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. You know what it is today? I don't, but that sounds like a very small number compared to what's been thrown around lately. Well, uh, yeah, 30 trillion. <laughs> 32 yes. trillion. I mean, it's 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 basically doubled in 10 years. And and we know that that's not sustainable. We are allowing, our generation is allowing um, a debt to be passed on to future generations that's just completely unsustainable. You and I can't, you know, not balance our checkbooks. We understand the importance of, of you know, handling our money responsibly. And our federal government is just plain flat not doing that. And we're, we have to find a way to hold them accountable. One of the things, you know, we throw around be, these numbers, millions, uh -huh. billions, trillions. Uh -huh. and, and for most of us, that's way too many zeros. My bank uh -huh. account doesn't operate with that many zeros. And so we don't really have a concept of the difference between like a billion and a trillion. But I, I came across an analogy that I really like to use. And um, do, do you have any idea how long a million seconds would, would take or would be? Uh -uh. Sorry, didn't focus. Well. So a million seconds is about 11 and a half days. So okay. if, if, if that's a million seconds, how long is a billion seconds? Uh -huh. 32 uh -huh. years. That's the difference between a million and a billion. And if you want to go to trillion, a trillion mm -hmm. seconds would be 32,000 years. You're talking prehistoric caveman dinosaur days, right? And we, when we say our country's $30 trillion in debt, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's enormous, enormous sons of money. And I, I just, it makes me feel really bad, you know, that my... My uh, parents' generation fought in World War II. Uh -huh. You know, they gave us the, the the blessings of liberty and freedom that we are currently enjoying. And, and what my generation is passing on is is unsustainable debt. Yes. With and no stop in sight, it sometimes feels yeah. like it's not so. even... And, and I like that analogy. It makes it a little bit more visual, like a little bit more like you can the concept yeah. well, <laughs> of a lot like of money. 11 and a half days to, to, you know, 32 years. That's a, that is a different, that's a concept that, and, and you're right. When you start throwing around those numbers, it, it kind of goes right over people's heads. They're not really paying attention because you, they can't grasp the concept of it. And that's, and that, so. that is true. And, and what the repercussions of us doing this really is. I totally agree. Nothing is free. And we've done a lot of free over the last few years with government stuff. And it's just, um, it, it was definitely will catch up to us. So looking at um, real things that people can do, I feel like you grabbed this book on a plane and we're like, I want to do something. And you found an organization to do something with. What can people it, it, it again, it's like this concept of federal government is way out there and we there's nothing we can do. And so people do nothing. Right. And that's that's the frustrating part of it. But there's they're uneducated or unaware of what they can do. So what like what's the next thing if they're like, man, I agree. This is this is not good. <laughs> like what's an what's a thing that they can actually do? So. Um, let me back up just a minute and okay. explain just a little bit about um, how Convention of States works. What, what we're doing is we're using one of the clauses in the Constitution in Article 5. Article 5 talks about how we amend the Constitution. And the, everybody knows how it's typically been amended um, 27 times in the past. Uh, Congress proposes an amendment. Those amendments go out and the states ratify those amendments. But a really little known clause is the next part that says, upon the application of two thirds of the states, the states can get together in a convention to amend the constitution. And that clause was put in there for just such a day as this, our founders in their wisdom and their brilliance saw that there could come a time when the government became tyrannical. 
and they wanted the states to have a way to rein them, them in. And that's why they wanted the states to have the opportunity to propose amendments. They knew that Congress wasn't, if it became tyrannical, it wasn't going to, to rein in its power and its spending. Mm -hmm. So that's what's so powerful is that we can have an influence on our state legislatures in a way that is going to be very difficult with Congress and people thousands of miles away in Washington, D.C. I, I, I'm going to know who my state representative in Texas is. It's very easy for me to meet with him in a town hall and, and go to his local office and talk to him and um, work on his campaign and, and develop a, a, a tight knit network. And so it's, it's, it's much easier. And that's so I guess how, how you get involved in convention of states is basically the first thing you would do is sign the petition. And as a petition signer, that goes right to your local representative. So they are continually being notified that, hey, these are, are people that, that want to see a change, that want to see uh, us have this uh, convention of states where potential amendments could get proposed to rein in the, the spending and the, the power and the jurisdiction of the federal government. So the first thing I would say is sign the petition. And then if you've got any time on your hands, we're constantly looking for, for volunteers. And, you know, if if you're willing to volunteer, the, the plethora of opportunities to get involved is enormous. We have phone banking. We have block walking. We work on other legislation to stay involved. Because what we're really, even though our goal is to call a convention of states, our real mission has become uh, essentially building an army of citizen activists. We, we want to build a grassroots army that effectively has influence over our state legislatures. Because, you know, part of the reason we have the problems in government that we have today is too many good people have been asleep at the wheel for way too long. Mm. And it's, well, yeah. we're going to be a republic and it's up, it's going to be up to we the people to, mm -hmm. to change things and, and make things happen differently. And so we need lots of us, millions of us to, to stand up and, and, and put our names together and aggregate our voices. And, and I think we will find that we do have a lot of influence and that it's not as hopeless of a task as, as one might think. Mm -hmm. And how, um, how, what's the best way to get the word out? Cause so asking people to sign this petition, um, and to, and to back this convention of states, like that prompts the state to then uh, agree to the convention, right? And we have to get so many states signed up. Right, right. Um, so we we need to get to 34 states or two thirds of the states. Currently we're at 19, almost 20. That's a little bit of a long story, the, the 20th state. But but in, in Texas, for example, we actually have passed a resolution. Our state legislature has passed the resolution calling for a convention of states. Uh, that's great. However, they also passed um, what we like to call an expiration date. And we are currently working to remove that expiration date because uh, what it essentially says that in, in uh, early 2025, if the convention hasn't been called yet, that our call for it in Texas would expire. And then we'd have to start all over again. So we're working Again, part of the reason we need everyone to be part of that grassroots army, we're working very hard to get that expiration date removed. If we can't get it removed, at least appreciably extended. Mm -hmm. uh, because I do think you will see this happen when, I don't know, is it going to take a few years? Is it going to take 10? I, I don't know. But I do know that it, it's very slow to turn the wheels uh, of legislation um, and we are really gaining momentum. I, I really like to see, uh, last year we had four more states join, which was great because there was a big lull during COVID. So I think, and if, if you go to our website, our website, conventionofstates.com, you can not only sign the petition there, but that you can do a ton of your own research. You can see which states have currently passed as well as which ones have legislation pending in one of uh, their legislative chambers. Uh, you can read all about any questions that people have about how this process works. It's a great amount of, of research and tools that you can look at and, and do some of your own homework as well. Yes. So four states in one year is impressive. 
if we could keep on track with that, we would call a convention in states in the next three to four years. That would, that would be that amazing. Would, that would be amazing. <laughs> You're so right. That is awesome. And I just, and again, I feel like, like you were out there on, you know, looking for somebody to get something like this started and then being so relieved to know there is a way um, that is completely legal, that is built right into our constitution to get, to create some term limits. Congress always says, I, I feel like I hear it on every platform. I, I agree with term limits and then they get elected and then all of a sudden they just don't agree with them anymore. <laughs> like, that you, works once they're in power. It's a pretty tough thing to give up. Yeah. So George Washington was so amazing that he could set that precedent and actually step away from power. And he's left us that legacy. And unfortunately, even though it's for the most part followed suit with, with presidents, uh, did have a little a little hiccup there with Roosevelt. But, um, you know, I'd love to see something like that happen with our, our congressmen and our senators and, you know, potentially Supreme Court justices. We know what a, a nightmare that is, um, as well as the the deep state. You know, we, that was really exposed under a Trump presidency. You see how entrenched bureaucrats can bring, you know, their biases to their jobs and have a lot of influence. So, Yes, and, um, and amendments that would deal with those types of, of things would be great. Let me throw out, if I could, um, a couple amendments that people may not um, think of. Obviously, uh, some type of you know balanced budget with taxing amendments that that kind of rein in the spending. But you know, how about um, an amendment that says you can only have single subject legislation in Congress that would eff effectively do away with these you know, four or 5,000 page omnibus bills where they shove all kinds of crap in there that has nothing to do with the original subject matter. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for mm -hmm. our legislators to, to read that stuff, to understand it, to, to know what it entails. And that is not what was intended. And, um, you know, I think something like that could truly be a, a bipartisan way to start and, and do an enormous amount of good immediately. Yes. If, if something like that uh, be put into play. Yes, I totally agree with that. I think that that's the loophole that's been found to push things through that weren't even on the agenda to start with. Um, unfortunately, every good deed, um, somebody tries to find a loophole around to, to fit their agenda. So bringing it kind of back to a, to common ground, um, it, you know, it's funny, I, I listened to someone from the Convention of States talk about term limits and why it wasn't put in there in the first place, because this wasn't a role that anyone wanted. <laughs> they, they went, they wanted to go serve their term for a year or two and then go back into the community and follow the laws that they put into place. It wasn't even a, it, it they weren't thinking long-term power like that. Um, and then I guess over time, I mean, they you know, that's what it turned into. So I, I just think there's so much, so much good that can be done with helping people understand that there is something that they can do. And I think there's a lot of hope and power behind that as well for the American people. I, I agree. And that's one of my favorite parts about actually volunteering for Convention of States is a lot of times, you know, I'll be talking to somebody that, that raises their hand and said, you know, I'm, I might like to volunteer. And, and they, they do, they're, they're fairly hopeless, hopeless that there's anything that they can do. And they're super excited to, to find out that, you know, perhaps we do have a way. Uh, one of our, our things that we like to say is that we have a solution as big as the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's different. It's, it's a little bit, um, you know, not known. Not, not really understood, but I think as we, you know, part those curtains and help people to understand that there's actually a tool in the Constitution to, to help fix some of our, our problems, uh, I, I, they get excited. So I love that. Absolutely. Well, I know this takes a lot of energy to get out there and to rile people up and be the grassroots coordinator that you are. So how do you stay, how do you stay motivated? That is a that is a great question. Um, I, I think you know it. It my motivation originally came from um, a, a 
public speaker and radio pundit. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with him always, but his name's Glenn Beck. And he said something at one point, he said, what are you going to tell your kids and your grandkids that you were so busy doing that you let liberty slip through your fingers? Um. And that has just really resonated with me. Ooh. I just cannot stand the fact that it, on my generation's watch, we're losing our freedoms, that our First Amendment freedoms that are, are guaranteed are under tremendous assault right now. Our Second Amendment freedoms are under assault. Uh, much of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution as a whole is under assault. And uh, that just makes me really sad. And it, it keeps me uh, wanting to, to be in the fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a powerful statement. That's a good one. <laughs> Like there is no excuse to not yeah. do something. I mean, just, you know, I'd, I'd like to be on a raft uh, in my pool reading a, a novel. I mean, there are a lot of things I'd rather be doing sometimes, but uh, it's it's that important. Yes. And if I want to be part of the solution, I can't just, you know, talk about it. I've, I've got to get, got to jump in with both feet and, and be involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. So and where did you go ahead? I don't mean to cut you off, but I got to say, too, we have such an awesome team um, here in Texas and nationally that that's inspirational as well. Getting to work with these people and see how um, involved they are and, and, and the time and energy they're willing to spend um, on our behalf, that that makes me want to do more as well. So, yes, it's contagious, right? Yes. So, OK, so how did you find your love for politics in this this kind of world that you're you're in now um that's interesting um you know i i don't know i just i feel like there's just kind of a need for it and so i i just kind of jumped in because you know i've, I've i'm a mom and like i mentioned earlier i, I work full time and um i i'm busy with our church and and our neighborhood so it wasn't like I was just dying to be involved in politics, but I think what's, how's the saying go? You might not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Uh -huh. And I just can't let, stand by and let, you know, special interest groups or squeaky wheels have, have all the power. Uh, somebody's got to, enough of us, just regular family folk have to stand up and say, no, we, we have a voice and, and it needs to be heard as well. Mm -hmm. I love that. So what, if you had a book, I know a book started this whole thing for you, but if you had a book that you said, I highly recommend that you read this, what book would you recommend people to read? So I, I did, I mentioned, and I, I can, I can show you. Lots <laughs> <I can, laughs> of these copies, I hand out tons of them. Um, the Liberty Amendments, Mark Levin. He is a constitutional scholar. He's going to be able to go into to great detail on um, not only the, what he sees as some of the problems, but how some very specific amendments that you may not have even thought of could could go a long way toward toward solving these problems. So that would have to be top top of the list. The Liberty Amendments. The yep. Liberty Amendments by Mark Levin. Awesome. Thank you. So, okay, so we are books, beauty, and business. So what is your daily, um, what is your favorite, sorry, what is your favorite beauty tip? Oh, I just, um, I think it's far more important to be, you know, fit and healthy than to worry about, you know, what, what you look like per se. I think, you know, when you are doing things that you enjoy and, and love that that just sort of radiates through your countenance and and to me that that's the most important thing i just love to to be out you know, playing pickleball and you know hanging with my girlfriends and having lunch out and you know and like uh, lucky for me i have great people to to work with in my volunteer activities and and that to me um, is what keeps me all, all together, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that to be fit and healthy. That really is, you know, our ideal goal, right? And when we are healthy, 
like, well, it's when you're not healthy, you're like, oh, okay, this is, I now I didn't appreciate it so much. And so taking care of yourself and being in that, that healthy person, I, I totally get that. I'm not addicted to working out. I, I do anything I do so that I continue to feel good. That's, there you go. <laughs> so I can continue to go out and eat lots of guacamole at my favorite. <laughs> That's my motivation. Yeah. But Excellent. Well, do you have anything that you do daily? So sometimes we talk about daily tips for success. Some people say, you know, you need to be meditating every day or uh, exercising, like you just mentioned, uh, doing something every day. Do you have any tips that you make sure that you are doing on a daily basis? Um, you know, I, I, I definitely have a spiritual dimension to my life. And, and so I, I try to pray daily, try to read my scriptures daily. Uh, and that I think gives me a lot of fortification uh, it, in a lot of ways. I think what we're seeing uh, as far as, as problems in our society is a real battle against good and evil. And uh, my evil is really real. And I, I have to have that, uh, that fortification on a daily basis to, to fight the good fight. Absolutely. I think that is a, is a huge part of um, continuing just to have that internal drive and that internal motivation for yourself as well and to stay connected um, in that way. I think that's super powerful. Good, good advice. So um, before we wrap up here, do you have any additional motivation or advice for the ladies listening? Um, well, you know, I, as a grassroots coordinator for my organization, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't give a, a final pitch to, to please check out conventionofstates.com. Um, we need to, to band together if our voice is going to be heard and, and be meaningful. And, and I, I feel like this is short of some really not pleasant solutions to our problems. You'll hear things like secession and revolution and, and coups. And there, there are a lot of not very pretty solutions to, to some of the problems that we're experiencing. And I think this is an awesome constitutional solution to, to help fix and help right the ship in this, this great nation that we've been so blessed to, to live in. So conventionofstates.com, I'd really uh, love for you to, to check that out. And if you can find the time, uh, join us as a volunteer. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. All of her information will be below in a link. So if you guys are interested, please check it out, sign the petition, sign up. Um, and reach out to learn more. Thank you so much for listening today. Until next time. Bye, guys.